Well, thanks, Brother Steve. Tonight, as uh, Steve just said, we're going to have an introduction and an overview of Colossians. And towards the end, God willing, we'll get into some of the stuff that, that the uh, exhortation that comes from chapter one. But basically, uh, as, as Steve said, uh, uh, it, the, the title tonight is Colossians, or for the, for the series is Colossians, an exhortation for unity in love. So it's to do with our love for our family. It's our love for our brothers and sisters, which is slightly different to our love for our, our actual immediate family. It's a love for the wider brotherhood. It's to do with fellowship and how we fellowship those about us in the truth and in the brotherhood. Our, our theme really comes from Colossians chapter 3. If you look at Colossians 3, reading from, well, probably from verse 12, and, and, and our theme comes from those few verses there. Verse 12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against even against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So there's our theme that we'll go through over the five studies we're going to look at Colossians. Now, according to Smith's Bible Dictionary, Colossae was a city in the upper part of the basin of the Meander River. You can see the Meander River just goes up, finishes just near Laodicea. There's another river that flowed from near Colossae into the Meander. It was called the Lycus. Herapolis and Laodicea were ecclesias in the immediate neighbourhood. But surrounding Colossae, just in that area, is the seven ecclesias written of in Revelation. But Colossae, Colossae was not included in those seven <coughs> ecclesias. The need wasn't seen for it. So the inhabitants at this time of, of that place, Colossae, were pagan idolaters before the word came to them. They indulged, we're told, in scriptures and, and many practices which were abominable in the sight of God. As we learn from Paul's inspired description of the believers in their unenlightened state, he says in chapter 3, at verses 5 to 7, he speaks of their state. He says there was fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, which means evil lusts or desires. There was covetousness, which he says is idolatry. And, and he says, in which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. So in speaking of their position before the Most High God, whilst indulging in this kind of behaviour, he describes them in chapter 1 and at verse 21 he says of them, you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. But it's to such people as these, such alienated and wicked men who were yet dead in their sins, we're told in chapter 2 and verse 13 of Colossians, that the seed of the word of the truth of the gospel was sown by the founder of the ecclesia, the Epaphras. In chapter 1, verse 7, it says, You learned, these people learned of Epaphras, who was a dear fellow servant, a faithful minister for Christ. So he was the founding member of that ecclesia in Colossae. We're told that. We won't go and look at it, but in chapter 4, we'll get there in our studies at some point. And he was the founding member of that ecclesia. Now, once sown, once the seed had been sown in these people, the seed found good ground in their hearts, and they heard it, and they understood it. Now, if, you, if we had time, we'd go back to Matthew, and we can show that from Matthew. They heard it, it was in their hearts, they received it, and they understood the truth. And it was, it, it, the seed implanted them was readily germinated, and it flourished amongst these people in the seclusion. Whole households, we're told, were convinced of the truth. Over in uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 18, whole households were converted to the truth. 
In verse 18, it says the wise. The wise were converted. And then it gives some advice for them. Verse 19, husbands were converted. Then it gives advice. Love your wives. Children, children of the husbands and wives were converted. And he gives advice to them. Obey your parents, etc. Fathers. There was fathers of these families converted to the truth. He gives advice on how to deal with the children. Verse 22, servants. Because they had servants in those days. They owned people. They had servants. These servants were converted to the truth. They no longer were servants. They were brothers in Christ. And then he says in chapter 4 and verse 1, their masters were converted also. Difficult relationship. You're the master one day with a servant, and the next day you're brothers in Christ. And you have to deal with that. So whole families were readily converted to the truth. Husbands, wives, children, masters and servants. And the seed actually very quickly took root in them because the Apostle Paul describes it in, in, in Colossians 1 at verse 6 he says that bringing in the second half of that chapter he said bringing, they were bringing forth fruit since the day you heard of the gospel and you knew the grace of God and truth so he speaks very highly of this ecclesia these Gentiles that came to the truth so it was that the ecclesia of Colossae was compro comprised of, of a of a real cross-section of society. It embraced, it embraced young, old, male, female, slaves, free men, yet they were all united in a common zeal, Paul says, a common zeal and enthusiasm for the truth of the gospel. He says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, they were all one in Christ Jesus. Now this ecclesia, we're told, this first ecclesia, this founding ecclesia in this place, was in Philemon's house. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that the brothers and sisters were those that were referred to by Paul in Philemon, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2. He, said, he refers there to a certain brethren. He says, to the ecclesia. He writes to Philemon and he says, to the ecclesia in thy house. Now, Philemon was a man who owned slaves. But this ecclesia has been formed and they're holding their meetings in his house. Now, the epistle to Philemon was also addressed to a disciple we see there in chapter 1 and verse 2 called Archippus. And he was, we're told in Colossians 4, 17, it says of Archippus that take heed to the ministry that has received in the Lord that they are fulfill it. So they would say this to Archippus. He's the founding member of this ecclesia. And in addition to this, we're told that in the epistle to Philemon, it deals with the return of Onesimus, a runaway slave. A slave that, it says there in Colossians 4 verse 9, it says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So Onesimus ran away from his master. He learnt the truth. He got baptised. He goes back to this ecclesia to his master, who no longer is his master, but his brother in Christ. <clears throat> Have difficulties in ecclesial life from time to time? Try dealing with that way. One, one day you're the man's master, the next time, day he's not only your servant, he's no longer your servant, he's in your house, attending the ecclesia in your house. They have to get along. So... He, he became a member of the, ecclesia, the Colossian Ecclesia. And it's significant that in the latter part of Colossians, Paul was inspired to give specific guidance. And, and we'll get there in later studies. He gives specific guidance to slaves and their masters and how they ought to behave one to another. And that's relevant to today. We don't have slaves and masters today. We do have employers and employees. We do have bosses and employees. And we're, this, the same relationship has to operate in the world today, especially if sometimes you, your boss might actually be a brother in Christ. So it's, it's significant for us that he gives advice to slaves and masters as well. And, but the advice he gives on how to behave with each other is irrelevant of the relationship. It's how we should behave towards one another regardless. And it would appear that the epistle to Philemon was written to exhort Philemon, Onesimus' master, to receive him back. Now, as a brother. He's no longer a slave, he's a brother. And, and the, the, the letter to the Colossians follows on from this, providing 
Further guidance, when the runaway slave had been reconciled to Philemon and moreover had been accepted into that ecclesia which met in his house. Now, the preeminent characteristics of these saints, these Gentiles who become believers at Colossae, which gave rise to so much joy for the Apostle Paul, that the preeminent characteristics they displayed were faith and love. Now we see there in um, chapter 1 at verse 4, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. So these two unifying principles of the fruit of the Spirit, as it's called, as these two character, characteristics are called, in Galatians 5, these two fruits of the Spirit are the qualities, these two things, faith and love, are these two qualities which bind the many members of an ecclesia, whether it's been around for a long time or whether it's a new little ecclesia like this. It's faith and love which binds the many members into one single united body. So having received the truth then, the believers we're told, all come, Ephesians 4 verse 13, they all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, or as that means, a complete man. And, Ephesians tells, and speaking the truth in love, this complete man may grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. So it's faith in the revealed truth of God which draws men and women from a variety of backgrounds and circumstances to be gathered together in a common home. But it is when individual members have love towards each other, it's then that these believers become tightly bound together as one single conglomerate whole body. Faith that we must have love towards each other. So it is then that the apostle exhorted the Colossians. He says in Colossians 3 at verse 14, he says, above all these things, above all these things, put on love which is the bond of perfectness. Or as the RSV renders it, it says in the RSV, love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So love is the common bond. It uses that word bond, it would love which binds or bonds. That word bond means a joint tie. Now we've known a joint tie medically as a ligament, maybe a tendon. So, but it's a uniting principle. That's what Strong says. It's a ligament, a, a joint tie joining the individual parts of the body together, a uniting principle. And it harmonises everything, uniting all members together as the ligaments in the body hold the body together in a mutual appreciation of things that are divine. So it is that the first chapter of Colossians then is devoted to the theme of what we might call the united body of Christ. How... We as believers have been delivered from the power of darkness. It says in chapter Colossians 1 verses 13 to 14, we've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son in prospect to become united as one single body which ultimately the fullness of God can dwell. When we're united, the fullness of God will dwell with us. So chapter 2 continues on that theme, emphasising the, the completeness of the united body. It says in chapter 2, at verse 9, In him, and that is Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. The fullness or completeness of God dwells in Christ, who is the brightness of his glory, we're told in Hebrews 1 verse 3, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. 
And we, being baptized, we're told in chapter 2 of Colossians at verse 12, we being baptized into him ought also to be complete in him. Nothing else needs to be added, nothing at all. For any deficiency in each individual, and there are many, I know I have many deficiencies, but any deficiencies in the constituent members thereof are forgiven. Because of the perfection of their master with whom they are at one, being, as it says in verse 2 of chapter 2, being knit together in love, in a mutual acceptance of the gospel of truth. But there were those, we're told in Colossians, who sought to impose the ordinances of the law of the gospel, to the gospel. They wanted to include in the gospel, right into it, bits of their ordinances, their laws. And the, the, these Juda, Judaizers comprised what would be called the apostasy in Paul's day. And it says that uh, they sought to add to the gospel. They wanted to add things to it by, impo by imposing a burden which neither they nor previous generations could bear. It says in Acts 15 verse 10, reading from the ESV version, Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test? by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. So it was that, that as the apostle exhorted the Galatians, in chapter, five, uh, uh, in, in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, Stand fast. Stand fast in those things you were baptised into believing. There, and therefore in the liberty, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now there was a tradition with these Judaizers. Speaking of the doctrines of the Judaizers, the Apostle Paul warns us in chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The fact that what they taught was a vain deceit in the tradition of men demonstrated clearly the point that what was being added to the gospel was not even the Mosaic law. It was rather a corrupt system of man's making which just passed for the law. Mark 7 verse 6 to 9 says, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. So it was that Paul had to cover these things with them. That because these men added to the word of God in two ways. Firstly, they, they laid aside and rejected the precepts of the law, substituting their own traditions in, in its place. And then secondly, they sought to add to this, this, this pseudo-law to the gospel of Christ. And sadly, over some time, how much do we see that happening in the ecclesias today? to deny the fundamental truths of Scripture and put in their place the vanities of human philosophy. But Paul's inspired argument demonstrates that because the body is complete in Christ, there's no need, there's never any need for any further addition, whether it be the actual Mosaic law or anything else, there's no need for it. Because being baptised into Christ, the believers are then redeemed from the curse which the law brought. Because the, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ has provided a way of forgiveness. It says in chapter 2, Colossians verse 14, that blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So the exhortation to the, Coloss to the Colossians, which is equally applicable to our circumstance, was in, in Colossians 2 verses 6 to 7, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught. 
So we must hold fast to the ways of the truth that we've been taught. We must let no one beguile us into detracting from it or adding to the revealed gospel message by the vain philosophy of man. Now, it was a problem. It's a problem for us today. It was a problem in Paul's day. It's always been a problem, but we've got to be aware of it. And he goes on with the Colossians and says, Faith, yes, but it must be manifested in works. Vital though the maintenance of pure doctrine is, absolutely vital, to merely acknowledge the principles of the truth is in itself is just not good enough. Faith, unless it be manifested in works, we're told in James chapter 2, verse 17, is dead, being alone. The way of life, which we've heard so much about in those fantastic studies we had on the cherubim, the way of life is, comp is comprised not just simply of doctrines to be believed, but also principles that we must practice in our daily life. Principles which are enshrined in those doctrines. And that's the theme of the latter part of this epistle that Paul wrote to the Colossians. When we come to a knowledge of the truth, that knowledge should so influence our outlook in life that our whole desire is just to do what our Lord requires of us. Nothing else. That should be our whole outlook in life. And that desire finds expression for us initially when, when we submit to baptism in enacting our, our commitment to following the example of our Lord and crucifying the flesh with the affections and the lust thereof, as Galatians 5 says. Now, in baptism, when we are baptised, we wholly devote ourselves to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Now, that says that in Romans. We devote ourselves at baptism to our Lord as a living sacrifice. We're offered upon the foundation of what already has been accomplished in the Christ altar. Accomplished for us on our behalf. So the apostle exhorts us then in Colossians 3 at verse 1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And, and he continues in, in verse 5 of Colossians 3, and reading from the RSV, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Put it to death. Now, whilst the seeking of heavenly things is absolutely vital to our individual salvation, it's also absolutely essential for the spiritual well-being of the body, of the ecclesia. Unless the various members are joined both in their affections one for another and in their implementation of the principles of Scripture in everyday life, they cannot be truly united. Possibly the greatest test of whether the individual members are truly at one in this regard is, is not seen so much in our behaviour and our conduct before the unbelievers, important as that may be, but it's seen in our relationships together, one with another. That's where it's really seen. And this is the main thrust of what Paul teaches in this chapter, to be truly united as an ecclesia in fellowship. The believers must not manifest any earthly behaviour towards each other. And I know we do. I know we fail. But this is the idea. We must not manifest any earthly behaviour towards each other. But we, we really have to mirror the character of the one that we said we would embrace in our baptism. Now, at chapter 3 in verse 8 to 10, it says... But now ye also put off all these. Put off anger. Put off wrath and malice. Any blasphemy, any filthy communication of your mouth. Lie not one to another. This is our, about our relationship together, brothers and sisters. Lie not one to another. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And how much does today's generation actually need that very wife wise counsel of the Apostle Paul. You know, just, oh, that, you know, uh, it would be, wouldn't it be wonderful that brethren would heed that exhortation today? Colossians 3 verse 13 says, if, if they could just understand this verse, you know, if everybody could, how, how wonderful life and the truth would be. Colossians 3 verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, 
If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. It's easy to read. It's not quite so easy to put into practice. We all fail, but we've got to try so hard. Now, one often wonders how many ecclesial difficulties and differences down through the years might have been healed simply by just a little bit more forbearance, maybe just a little bit more forgiveness. The common tendency today in disputes of any kind, it's, it's a common thing, it, it's, it's a fault of the nature we all bear. So the common thing in disputes is to, to find fault with one, one of our brethren, or with others, might be more than one, who we seem to be for some reason in disagreement with. We not only just start to disagree when we then look for faults in them. And in the case of quarrels between brethren, most commonly, they turn out to be over petty matters of minor significance when it's all analysed. So the natural tendency then is to go and speak of those faults to other, others, at, at trying to invoke them to take sides. We all do it, and I've done it. It's wrong. If not in the actual debate, invoking them to take sides, in trying to get them to agree with our denigration of the other party. Oh, he's so bad. Oh, you must have seen it. We read in Proverbs 6, verse 19, These six things doth Yahweh hate, yea, seven are the abomination of his soul, eyes that are lofty, a tongue that is false, and hands shedding innocent blood, a heart contriving iniquitous devices, feet hasting to run into mischief, one that uttereth lies, a false witness, and one sending forth strifes between brethren, which in other places it calls, calls sowing discord. So that's how the seeds of discord are sown. They fester and they grow in men's hearts, inevitably resulting in divisions and strife. James chapter 4 verse 1 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, from the flesh, that battles in you? And they tear apart the unity of an ecclesia. A unity that previously has been experienced. Personal differences of this kind, though, are an entirely different category to those affronts to the truth caused by the introduction of wrong doctrine and practice is being disseminated by, disseminated by those who, who try to introduce another gospel, as it speaks of in, in Galatians 1, verses 6 to 8. In those cases, the offence is not against us personally, as against Yahweh himself, against his son, and against the word which they both preach. Jude, in Jude we read, well, in this case, the faith, Jude tells us, must be earnestly contended for at all costs. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So any personal differences must take second place. That is, if we should give them any place at all. Because the contention is not here for self-acquittal usually, it's for the condemnation of others. What we should be trying to do is preserve the way of life. But in all other cases, wise will exercise discretion, manifesting fervent love amongst themselves. 1 Peter 4 verse, in, verse, 1 Peter 4 verse 8 says, For love shall cover the multitude of sins. When we love each other, we overlook the little things. They don't become an issue for us. For the sake of the unity of their body, unless issues are of a fundamentally important nature, personal differences must be forgotten, however difficult that may be for us as individuals. And, and I, I, I must admit I find difficulty with that at times because love and forgiveness should be exercised just as Christ forgave us. And we should never, never forget, as it tells us in Romans chapter 5, at verse 6, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And verse 8 continues, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we find then that the Lord's 
epistle through Paul to the Colossians is, is both highly structured, it's very progressive for its time, and it begins with the believer's acceptance of the word, exhorting their separation from this power of darkness and in pledging allegiance to a kingdom that is yet future. And that's what we've all done. Then it speaks of the ideal unity of the body of believers having figuratively died together in baptism that they might also live together, striving together in unity and in love for the glorious hope which we all share. It warns us, and this it warns the Colossians, but it warns us to be on our guard against the addition of the fables of men to the Gospels of Christ. Yet it exhorts them to allow their common zeal and love for the holy things of God to find the highest expression in their relationship one with another as brethren of the one who gave us all for our sakes. In the final exhortation in chapter 4 of Colossians is an appeal for the believers to pray for a door of utterance. It's the words Paul uses, the door of utterance, where the gospel might continue to be preached. In chapter 4, at verses 2 to 4, it says, Continue in prayer, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I might make it manifest as I ought to speak. So we have to be actively praying for a door of opportunity to be open. We should pray for the circumstances in which others about us might hear the words of truth being spoken. Pray for this door of utterance to be opened. Pray always for our Father's blessings on all our activities, especially in preaching the truth. And if we pray in that manner, we will be blessed. So in these words of the Apostle, what we see is the spirit of, of a man, of a, one who wholly gave himself to the service of Christ and to the ministering to the body, to his brethren. Now, despite Paul being in times of immense hardship, and, and Paul says of himself, I was in bonds, and he's actually literally in bonds, in jail. And, and what's he thinking about? He's in bonds for Christ's sake, and his concern was not upon the restrictions that were placed upon himself, but rather that by being in prison, the preaching of the gospel has been hindered. I can't get about the work of my father. He exhorted the Colossians to pray, not for him, but such an opportunity may come, and it duly did, because the fervent prayers of, 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 of a righteous man are answered. Those separated by distance, the Colossians and Paul were united in prayers and thoughts, the true spirit of unity and love. So that then, with that introduction, forms the main theme of Paul's inspired epistle to the Colossians, an appeal for separation from the world and harmony amongst the body. That being so united, the believers then might seek to draw others into this glorious hope that they share. So let us, brothers and sisters, that now we, we, we've received the seed of the word, as to the Colossians did. They were Gentiles too. Let's allow it to grow in ourselves, to bring forth those fruits pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ, that by his grace we might have a hope for a future inheritance in the coming kingdom of God. So just as we finish up tonight, we're just going to look at some lessons that start to come through for us from Colossians. And when we reflect upon you know, the varied methods through which Yahweh instructs us by the, by the word, one of the most important features to be recognised, or that we should recognise, is the example of God's past dealings with Israel. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 we read, Now all these things happened unto them, to Israel, for example, and they are written down for our admonition. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So the modern tendency when we're considering Israel's, and to put it mildly, rather turbulent past, is sometimes to simply give scathing criticism because they've failed so many times. And sometimes, but less frequently, we might give commendation for their times that they've obeyed our Heavenly Father. Yet 
when we do it, when we look at it in that way, it misses the point of actually why our Heavenly Father, our eternal creator, has preserved such a record of all his dealings with these people, this nation. You know, it was never God's intention, the divine intention, for us to stand as judges over those of a bygone, bygone age, but rather that we might learn from their examples and from their experiences whether they were good or bad. God tells us about the good things and he tells us about the bad things. Upon reflection on their failings, we're encouraged by our Father to take heed lest we also fall after the same example of unbelief, as it says in Hebrews 4 verse 6. And upon reflection of the long-suffering and mercy of the Almighty, extended to them even their greatest failings, by learning and understanding these things, we can have hope that despite our personal weaknesses, if we but have faith, if we truly believe that the same long-suffering can be extended to us also, as it says in Romans 15 verse 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, for us, so that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. So it is that rather than to simply provide, rather God simply providing a list of commandments or bullet points as you might call them, defining principles, what Yahweh does is instructs his people by presenting examples both of faithfulness and unfaithfulness for us to consider and be instructed from. So turning our attention more particularly to this first chapter of Colossians, then we find that this is the method that is employed by our Heavenly Father. Through Paul, in describing the believer's hope of a, of a promised inheritance. Now in Colossians chapter 1 at verse 12, we read, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So here, the comparison appears to be with the deliverance of the children of Israel from another power of darkness, the strength of Egypt, which although being a, a centre of worldly wisdom and light, was in fact in the pit, in the depth of spiritual darkness. Under Moses, the people were brought out from under this power, and it says in Deuteronomy 4 verse 34, as a nation from the midst of another nation, he brought them forth, that they might commence their journey to the promised kingdom to be partakers of that inheritance that was promised to their fathers. So it's an example for us of separation. And being delivered from the power of Egypt through a typical baptism unto Moses, Israel becomes an absolute dramatic example of separation from the world, from the power of darkness. The parting of the Red Sea in forming their, their waters of baptism through which they passed in faith affected their severance from the faithless Egyptians who then perished in their attempt to pass through those very same waters. On the one side, we have the faithful on their journey to the promised kingdom, like us. And on the other, we have the idolatry of Egypt, the world. We have the death of the firstborn and the destruction of those who sought to hurt, sought the hurt of God's people. So the application of these examples and samples, as it says in Scripture, to our circumstances is absolutely clear. It says there in... Um, Exodus 3 verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. So, just as Israel were delivered through divine visitation, as I said in Deuteronomy, it says, God is saved to go and take, them, take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation, even so, it says, God also did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So just, just, as, and just as they uh, went through the baptism waters of the Red Sea, the power of Egyptian darkness then perished and they were provided redemption for the faithful. 
And even so, all be obedient believers in Christ in a like manner can be redeemed from the power of sin through baptism, we're told. Because it says in Romans 6, verses 15 through to 23, if you read the whole section, it says, Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. You leave behind a world of evil, of death and destruction, so we can journey towards the promised kingdom. And the apostle describes to the Colossians how the saints in light have left the unenlightened world of iniquity behind to join themselves to Yahweh's firstborn who he raised up from the dead. Colossians 1 at verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. In verse 18, he is the head of the body, the ecclesia, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The slaying of the firstborn in Egypt became the means of Israel's redemption. As in their anguish and mourning, the Egyptians then allowed the nation to leave. And it was following the death of his firstborn that even Pharaoh himself relented and permitted them to depart from bondage into liberty. Even so, for us, by the death of Yahweh's firstborn, his only begotten son, and by his perfect Passover offering, our deliverance can be effected. Affected. The great contrast being that Yahweh's firstborn was raised from the dead victorious. So we're told in Colossians 2 at verse 15. It says there that he, in verse 15, having spoiled principality, principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So he spoiled principles and principalities and powers so that other sons might follow being partakers of his victory. So the lessons there for us are there for us. Now, although the people were delivered from Egypt, their troubles were not yet over. In Jeremiah 2 verse 6, speaking of the ecclesia in the wilderness, that's their term, it says that, and I'll read from the RSV, it says, the wilderness, they, they, they had, for, in order then to reach their promised inheritance, they had to pass through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. Now, it's not the purpose, it was not the purpose of their Redeemer to place them in their land immediately. As it's, we go through a wilderness. We go through a period of time. We wander through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, trials, through a land of drought. The shadow of death is always over us. And it, But it wasn't God's purpose that, that they could be placed in their land immediately. Just like it's not his purpose that we can be baptized and immediately go to the kingdom. We have to be perfected for a place in the kingdom. So they, they had to travel towards the kingdom in faith and so learn to trust and believe in God, that he is their redeemer. And just like them, so do we. Now, it's in like manner that we as believers, that we, we journey along a narrow way to the kingdom. And we know it's not always easy. We know that we're not automatically saved despite the claims of some. But we, we have actually have a journey that we have to endure. For some, maybe that journey is longer than others. But that's according to the wisdom of our Heavenly Father. You know, we all travel through a spiritual wilderness. We have to face many trials. We're told in Psalm 24 verse 90, many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But why? It's to teach us faith and obedience. In the case of the Mosaic Ecclesia in the wilderness, as they're termed in Acts 7 verse 38, it became necessary for the provision to be made, a provision to be made to meet their temporal, their, their physical needs. Nourishment in the desert, they had to, have to provide for the temporal needs of the situation, but also as a continual blessing to give hope and assurance that their Redeemer would remain with them along through that treacherous journey that we all have to go through, which lay ahead until they reached their promised haven. And, the, and, and, and when they left Egypt, it was the prompt provision of manna that fulfilled both requirements. You know, the words of, of Yahweh came to Moses in Exodus 16, verse 4. He says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, 
and the people shall go, shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. And when the people had gathered their certain rate, they found that it was absolutely wholly sufficient for their needs. It was a token, really, declaring the power of Israel's God. Exodus 16, verse 12. In the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am Yahweh Elohim. So it was that Israel were taught of their God through these miraculous provisions that he made for their welfare, originating from heaven for them. And in the case of the ecclesia today, in the modern day wilderness, a very similar need of spiritual sustenance and nourishment remains just the same. A need that is amply satisfied with the bread of God. As it says in John 6 verse 33, the bread of God which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The spiritual bread, as we know, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, in whom all our hopes and all our expectations rest, and whose words sustain and strengthen us, because we are weary travellers, like when they came out of Egypt. Our walk sometimes becomes wearisome. We have to think of our Lord. We have to think of what he's provided for us and what he provides for us every day. And in the case of the ecclesia in, in the wilderness, I said, there's a similar need of spiritual sustenance and nourishment. And the spiritual bread is our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us that he says in John chapter 6, I am that bread of life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And in speaking of that word of life, particularly the hope it contains for those who partake of it, the apostle taught the Colossians, he says in Colossians 1 verse 5, he says, The hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So just as in the ecclesia in the wilderness had, had a physical nourishment, which was said to be rain for heaven from them, so we as believers, our hope is also said to be in heaven. That is, it's our Lord Jesus Christ who is in heaven. And, and yet, it didn't come to, to, to believers till after his ascension through the word that was preached by his apostles. So just as the manna filled the people, enabling them to know the power of their God, so it is that upon us partaking of the word of truth, we find, or we should find, that it is all sufficient for our needs. We become, as it says in Colossians 1, verses 9 to 10, we can't become filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, increasing in the knowledge of God. So for us then, there's a very powerful exhortation in this example of Israel. Just as they gathered in the manner daily so that they might be filled and satisfied by it, so we ought to gather in daily the wisdom of the word. We have to gather in daily the wisdom of the word so that we can be filled, we can be strengthened further in our knowledge and our appreciation of what our Heavenly Father provides. And if we neglect this vital duty, we only become spiritually weak and malnourished and, we are, and the probability of us reaching the land of promise will be no greater than, a, than an Israelite who couldn't take the time to collect some manna on a daily basis. And, and he says that that manna, he said, that is laid up for them. The Father through Paul informed the Colossians that their hope in chapter 1 at verse 5 says, it was laid up for you in heaven. Their hope was laid up in heaven. Now, that's instructive for us because there were two types of manna which were said to be laid up. Now, if we remember the instructions, the manna was to be collected daily, but on the sixth day, it says that a double portion was to be collect collected. It says in Exodus 16, tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. That which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept unto the morning. And they laid it up to the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. So the manna did not corrupt on the Sabbath. So it's speaking of the incorruptibility of the seventh day, and it's pointing forward for us, and an example for us, and it's an example points forward to the seventh millennial day of rest, when the saints will have put on incorruption, so that they might inherit the kingdom of God. That's the glorious hope 
that we have laid up for us, the hope of eternal life in God's kingdom. But we do read of another sort of manner that was laid up. It says in Exodus 16, verse 33, Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before Yahweh to be kept for your generations. So that manna <coughs> never corrupted. It was laid up, it says, before Yahweh. It was laid up in the ark. It was placed in the ark in the holy place of the tabernacle. So it's speaking to us of our Lord Jesus Christ, who after being raised incorruptible, he's entered into the most holy, into heaven itself. And it says in, in Hebrews 9 verse 35, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's why he's there, for us. That's the hope which we have, which is laid up in heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, who appears for us in the divine presence. Now we read in Colossians 3, verse 3 to 4, chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Well, brothers and sisters, our life, that is, it's speaking of the prospect of eternal life is hid with the Lord in heaven. When he returns, we will all be partakers of that hidden life. As it is written, Revelation 2 verse 17, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna.